Thank you for joining us for this uh, event, the KOL Roundtable on Leptomeningeal Metastases, an obvious disease target for radiotherapeutic intervention. My name is Justin Walsh, and I'm a covering healthcare analyst at Jones Trading. We're here with our esteemed KOLs, Dr. Priya Kumtager, MD, Associate Professor of Neurology and Medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine, and co-principal investigator of the RESPECT LM trial, and Dr. Andrew Brenner, MD, PhD, Associate Professor of Medicine, Neurology, and Neurosurgery at the University of Texas Health Services Center at San Antonio, Principal Investigator of the RESPECT GBM trial, and co-principal investigator of the RESPECT LM trial. We're also joined by Dr. Mark Hedrick, MD, who is the president and CEO of Plus Therapeutics. In terms of the agenda for the event, uh, after I provide a brief overview of the emerging radiopharmaceutical landscape, we'll turn to Dr. Kuhntaker for an introduction to and discussion of LM, and then Dr. Brenner for phase one, part A results from the RESPECT LM trial. This will be followed up by our Q&A portion and roundtable discussion. Although my, my interest in uh, the radiopharmaceutical field grew out of my PhD radiochemistry training, I believe that the current ratcheting up of uh, interest from investors naturally comes first and foremost from sales of recent FDA approved therapeutic and imaging agents. Without wasting too much time on the history, earlier targeted radiopharmaceuticals, namely Bexar and Zevelin, did well in the clinic but did not succeed commercially. Zofigo did better than these products, but sales peaked around 400 million euros in 2017, driven at least in part by mixed clinical data unique to the, that asset. Lutathera's use in neuroendocrine tumors was exciting, but the indication is comparatively small. By contrast, sales of PSMA-targeted Pluvicto, as well as F18 imaging agent Polarify, have already passed those of Lutathera in the second quarter of 2023. Gallium-68 PSMA-targeted PET imaging uh, is doing well as well, although it remains behind market-leading Polarify. In terms of clinical promise of radiopharmaceutical and or radiotherapeutic products, I point out that approximately 50% of cancer patients in the U.S. already receive some form of radiation therapy in their treatment journeys. While I doubt external beam radiotherapy will be totally supplanted, alternative approaches allow radiation to be preferentially targeted to cancer cells with more potent forms of radiation and may provide significant improvements in safety and efficacy if applied appropriately. To highlight a couple of recent or expected clinical advancements, data is expected from two large trials in the PSMA-positive pre-chemo metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer setting in the second half of 2023. The iodine-131 agent, IMAB-B, achieved positive results in a phase three trial in stem cell transplant conditioning, and multiple next-generation products are uh, being tested in both prostate and neuroendocrine cancer patients. As part of this boom and trend, we're seeing increasing diversity of radioisotopes being used. While this can be challenging for investors to follow, it's important that the right isotope with the right characteristics is selected for a given medical application. I anticipate that as additional clinical data accrues and the best use cases emerge, the number of isotopes approved for therapeutic applications will continue to grow, along with further supply chain and logistics support. In terms of opportunities, I expect that products that address specific therapeutic niches and take optimal advantage of their chosen radioisotopes will be most successful. This includes both molecularly tar targeted agents, particularly those targeting pan-cancer targets of interest, and agents targeted via nanoparticle delivery or other means. I expect diagnostic advancements to continue facilitating patient selection and outcome monitoring, and that the greatest opportunities lie in the indications that have proven most intractable, such as CNS cancers. Lastly, I anticipate combination opportunities where the mechanistic rationale is particularly strong, such as with immuno-oncology agents and DNA damage repair inhibitors. With those high-level thoughts and perspectives in mind, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Kuhntaker. Thanks so much, Dr. Walsh. So I will just quickly, over the next uh, 10 minutes, give as much as I can of a comprehensive yet succinct um, summarization of, of leptomeningeal disease. So lepto is essentially cancer of the pia and arachnoid layers, uh, kind of within the subarachnoid space, um, including the CSF. So we basically, when we see cancer cells in the subarachnoid space and within the CSF, we term that leptomeningeal disease. This is something that we see occurring in solid and hematologic malignancies. And what we see in terms of symptoms wise are directly related to essentially two different avenues. The first is symptoms of high increase, high intracranial pressure or ICP. 
So these are things like headaches, nausea, vomiting. And this occurs because the absorption system um, in leptomeningeal disease is altered. There's aberrancies there because we often see cells clogging that natural sponge-like arachnoid granulation system of the central nervous system. Other symptoms that we can see are often cranial nerve symptoms and spinal cord and nerve root symptoms. This occurs because we have, again, cancer cells in the subarachnoid space um, and other things that are living in the subarachnoid space are things like cranial nerves. So we can get you know, facial weakness, difficulty chewing, facial tingling, hearing changes, um, a lot of the kind of head and neck functions. And then we also see spinal cord uh, nerves and, and nerve root symptoms. So this can be manifested um, through uh, extremity weakness, uh, paresthesia, so numbness, tingling, and even pain, so neuropathic pain. Another symptom that I didn't write here is bowel or bladder changes, which are also from spinal nerve and nerve root being impacted by leptomeningeal disease. So there are many challenges in the treatment of leptomeningeal disease. Very similar to kind of the infamous blood-brain barrier, there's this structure called the blood CSF barrier. And really the take home of this slide is the therapeutics that we use in the body often don't work in the brain. And this is true both in brain parenchymal disease via the blood-brain barrier, as well as brain leptomeningeal disease, so the blood CSF barrier. These are biologic barriers that I'm showing here on the right that are pretty analogous. Uh, there are similar structures here, like um, for the blood-brain barrier, tight junctions between endothelial cells um, and the foot processes of astrocytes that prevent molecules from getting through, drugs from getting through the systemic or peripheral circulation into the brain. And very similarly in the CSF or the subarachnoid space, we have a similar barrier, the blood CSF barrier, that's also limited by tight junctions within this time the choroid cells as opposed to tight junctions within the endothelium. So very similarly structured mechanisms of a barrier that that do serve good purposes in protecting our brain from toxins, but unfortunately protect or keep out a lot of essential therapeutics that we need in cancer. So to talk about leptomeningeal disease and treatment is probably a, a, an hour long talk on its own, but I'm gonna try to summarize it here um, in, in the next slide or so. Um, essentially the goals of treatment are twofold. One is, of course, to make quality of life better, so symptomatic approach to patients. So here we want to reduce pressure on the brain caused by any of that CSF buildup, any of that increased uh, intracranial pressure, and also symptomatic approaches to things like the neurologic deficits so neuropathic pain, um, tingling, weakness, that sort of thing. So definitely a heavy symptomatic approach here. And then also potentially overlapping is the tumor-directed therapy. So we want to, of course, reduce the number of cancer cells within the CSF, within that subarachnoid space. So we achieve these goals through a few different modalities. Surgery is less utilized in leptomeningeal disease. I would say probably the most common surgical approach to leptomeningeal disease would be to, to put in a port that goes directly to the CSF so that we can inject treatments directly into there. But in terms of actual resection in leptomeningeal disease, this is not common practice. There's also radiation therapy. So this can be manifested in a few different ways. So this can be whole brain radiotherapy, focal radiotherapy, craniospinal, so the whole neuroaxis radiotherapy that can be utilized either with photons or a newer modality with proton craniospinal irradiation. There are also some medical therapies that can be useful in, in leptomeningeal disease. Unfortunately, here we have a ways to go, but there are a few therapies that we do utilize. This can be utilized in a couple ways, so it can be delivered systemically. So that can be you know, oral, IV, but essentially going through the whole systemic system or directly intrathecally, so directly into that CSF space, either via lumbar puncture or something like an omayaport directly into the lateral ventricles, so the fluid spaces of the brain. 
and definitely palliative care in terms of disease support and symptomatic support and even hospice care can be a big part of treatment as well. So when we're talking about the prognosis of leptomeningeal disease, unfortunately, in the prognosis currently is quite poor. So without treatment, prognosis can be on the order of weeks, and even with treatment on the order of months. There are specific subtypes that tend to portend a greater chance of leptomeningeal disease, and I have a few listed here, but essentially uh, subtypes like HER2 positive breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, um, or EGFR or ALK mutated lung cancers, just to name a few. And unfortunately, we have no effective therapies that are curative for this disease and no therapies that are specifically approved in this, in this leptomeningeal disease setting. So when we are putting all this together and considering treatment, uh, I definitely want to take note that not all leptomeningeal disease is the same. Leptomeningeal disease really refers to geography of where the cancer has spread to. So when we're deciding which of these treatments that I've discussed, which one to, to embark upon, there are a lot of things we have to keep in mind. So the type of systemic cancer, where is this coming from? What is its underlying biology? So for that, we need to know, you know, is it a solid tumor? Is it a hematologic malignancy? What's the primary histology? And what I don't have listed here is what, what tumor markers are present and are they, are they treatable? Can we go after some of those tumor markers? Also importantly is state of the systemic disease, right? So what's going on neck down? What's going on outside of the CNS? Do we need a therapeutic that can address both at the same time? Or are we primarily dealing with brain and CNS disease or CSF disease? Whether a patient has bulky or non-bulky leptomeningeal disease within their central nervous system is really important. This can impact the flow of CSF and therefore can impact the therapies that we can give within the CSF or systemically. A patient's performance status or how they're functioning is really important. So this comes both in the form of performance status as well as addressing a patient's symptomatic burden. So these are things that we that we use to then make a decision on which treatment approach to embark on. And I definitely want to, to take this moment just to say that CNS metastases as a whole have been understudied and what we need to do moving forward to make sure that these patients are highlighted and that we give them the appropriate amount of effort to, to move the field forward. So to give you an idea, I treat a tumor type called glioblastoma. So this is the most common malignant primary brain tumor in adults. We have an incidence of this in the US of about 12,000-ish a year. Uh, when I censored this data, there was about, there's over 300 studies, inter, uh, interventional studies specifically that were recruiting on clinicaltrials.gov. So for this incidence, this is kind of the, how many studies are open in, and accruing for active treatment at the same time. Now, contrast that to leptomeningeal disease with an almost tenfold incidence, and you have just a fraction of those track of. And here I'm not even comparing apples to apples. For the glioblastoma, the first row, I have active recruiting interventional studies. The second number for leptomeningeal disease is total studies. So when we look at the fine print, there's really just those 38 studies that are actively recruiting that are treatment studies. Now there's two points that I wanna make here. And one is that, you know, I've, I've been showing this slide for a few years and I, and I update it and I was really happy to see when I updated it over a two year period, that number of active recruiting studies for leptomeningeal disease has tripled. So I think it shows us that as a field, things are moving forward and we're really starting to appropriately spotlight these patients. And the other point that I wanna make on this slide is that this is the leptomeningeal disease incidence a year that we know. But one thing that we definitely are aware of is that leptomeningeal disease is underdiagnosed period. And this happens for a few different reasons. If, if 
clinicians aren't on the lookout for these symptoms and are not ordering these studies, they're not going to find it. And there are multiple publications and postmortem um, uh, manuscripts that have shown that likely the true incidence of leptomeningeal disease is far higher than we've thought. So with, with some of that sort of grim prognosis, I, I think that there is positivity on the horizon. And it's important to understand that there's an evolution here, that change is happening. And it's seen even in the prior slide in terms of how many active recruiting studies we have in this disease population. In the past, CNS disease has been routinely excluded from clinical trials. And it was for a number of reasons. One was concern for CNS or brain toxicity. And there's a lot of challenges in trial design and lots of discussion in our field about what are, what are the appropriate clinical trial endpoints. So, you know, challenging disease as well as challenging clinical trials to design. Fortunately, in more recent years, and I'd say really over the past five to 10 years, CNS metastases have been spotlighted more through the ad advance of more imaging techniques, through improved clinical agents for systemic disease um, and prolonged survival of systemic cancer, we're seeing a lot more CNS disease alone. And we're seeing that these patients need more attention than ever. We need to really spotlight and see how we can move forward cancer care in the central nervous system. Another reason for this evolution, I think, is that we have many agents behind our uh, beyond our traditional cytotoxic or traditional chemotherapies. So there are many more targeted therapies, and uh, there's been a huge advancement, of course, in immunotherapy. So all this combined is leaving, leading towards what we feel is a really positive spotlight on CNS disease and really focusing on it more in cancer care and cancer advancement. Now with these additional clinical trials coming forward, it's important to highlight the challenges that we have so that we may overcome them. And I, I think the one of the top, if not the top challenge in leptomeningeal disease clinical trials are the challenges that we have in the diagnostics. So currently there are three components to the diagnosis uh, of leptomeningeal disease in standard of care. And these three components are radiographic in the form of MRI with and without contrast. The second is clinical assessment. And the third is CSF cytology. So with radiographic assessment, what we see here, and I'm not sure that this is going to show up quite well, but there's contrast enhancement that's almost in a linear pattern in the brain, as well as almost like a highlight along the spinal cord here. This is really hard to measure in a two-dimensional or three-dimensional fashion which makes following it longitudinally over MRI scans really difficult, as opposed to things like a liver met or a lung met that you're following, or even a brain parenchymal met. We can follow these pretty concretely in a two-dimensional or three-dimensional fashion on MRIs, but not with leptomeningeal disease because it is a disease of the fluid. We don't often get large measurable lesions to then target and follow longitudinally. Clinical assessment has many confounders that can be confounded by other medications like steroids. It can be confounded by other metastases in the body causing symptoms that can fluctuate. And then lastly, our, our gold standard of CSF cytology, which is capturing the CSF, essentially looking at under the microscope and assessing for, for the presence or absence of tumor cells. This is also laden with, with many challenges. So for, for starters, the sample viability is really tough. So if you leave the samples out or if you don't, you don't address them immediately after receiving them in a lab, you can have cell lysis. Um, you have essentially decreased ability to use that sample in an effective fashion. And even with good handling of the CSF, this is, this is a test with poor sensitivity. So we're talking about with one lumbar puncture, we get sensitivities of around 50%. And then with up to three lumbar punctures, you might get a sensitivity of up to 90%, which one I, th I think is a still pretty low sensitivity because you're still missing, let's say one or two of every 10. 
And also, we don't routinely like to put our patients through three consecutive lumbar punctures. So just because for, for multiple reasons, this test has uh, is lacking in, in multiple ways. And then with that foundation, the question is, can we do better? And fortunately, I think that answer is yes, we can do better. There have been many novel ways to um, isolate things like circulating tumor cells in the CSF, as well as cell-free DNA. So the general idea of this is when we obtain a CSF cycle uh, sample, we can spin it down and we have this kind of heavier cellular material that we can look at using various systems to then see how, you know, how many cells are present. And we can also take that supernatant and look at different acellular material and other DNA, et cetera, from, secreted from the tumor and tumor cells to see what's present. So we can look for tumor markers that we can actually potentially use novel therapeutics with. With this in mind, we have a prospective study that's looking at one of these novel therapeutics, or excuse me, novel diagnostics. And it, this clinical trial is called the 4C study. It utilizes a diagnostic called C-Inside. And C-Inside is a very unique diagnostic tool. It takes that CSF, just as we have discussed on the prior slide, looks at the cellular material, and we're actually able to get a quantitative tumor cell count in the CSF. This is something that hasn't been able to be done previously. We're also able to take that, again, that supernatant, that other part of the fluid, and look for novel treatment targets, potentially even. We can look for DNA coming from the tumor and cell-free DNA, essentially, and we can follow that over time as well as look for targets. So we're answering multiple questions with these novel diagnostics that we were not able to answer before with our current diagnostics. So we're able to answer, is there a tumor? Yes or no? Is there a target? And is there a trend? Because we actually have a quantifiable diagnostic tool. This tool also allows for serial monitoring. So this is going to be in the form again of CSF tumor cells, ctDNA and RNA, and, and what we're doing in the study is comparing it against current standard of care diagnostics. The way the clinical trial will look is that we'll have multiple time points so represented here by time point one, two, three, and so on. So we'll get a baseline and follow-ups. And at each of these time points concurrently, and that's really key, we are getting the novel diagnostic, which is the C inside testing out of Biosept. And then we are comparing it to our current three standards of care that we've previously discussed. So that's MRI, so radiographic, clinical, and CSF cytology. So we're really excited about this diagnostic study and its outcome. It's been open since about May and, and accrual is going really well. And we're hoping that then this novel diagnostic can be the new platform for patients with leptomeningeal disease, as well as a great way to modernize leptomeningeal disease clinical trials and make them effective. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Brenner. Thank you, Dr. Kumtar. Uh, so we're going to uh, talk uh, a little bit about a new therapeutic that we're uh, developing called Rhenium abysbamida. Rhenium abysbamida, as, as we like to uh, refer to it as rhenium nanoliposomes, is a uh, encapsulated form of radiation therapy. It uses a small molecule called BMEDA, which is a chelator that can trap the radiation. Then that allows the radiation to be held within the liposome. The liposomes themselves are made up of very similar constituents to the um, walls, walls of a cell, basically cholesterol and lipid. And the point of encapsulation really is to trap radiation so that it can be held within a tumor. You can see there on the right that when you uh, inject uh, a radiotherapeutic like rhenium directly into the tissue, as you can see in the blue and green lines, whether it's chelated or not, if it's not encapsulated, it just doesn't really stay within the tissue. It gets rapidly redistributed um, uh, via the blood and, and uh, disappears. Whereas once it's encapsulated in the liposome, it stays there not just for hours, but days or even weeks and then naturally uh, decays in the uh, tissue in which it was injected, being trapped by those tumor cells. On top of that, the encapsulation allows us to better deliver it. 
Uh, if you'll see on the bottom right corner there, you'll see that unencapsulated technetium, when you inject it into the tissues, it just kind of has like a little pinpoint of distribution. Whereas when you increase the size because of the characteristics of the liposomes, you get much better distribution um, and it spreads out through the tissue. So uh, in terms of the radar therapeutic we're using, it's uh, Rhenium-186. Uh, this has particularly uh, ideal characteristics for the use uh, in leptomeningeal metastases. Um, it has uh, a couple different characteristics. Number one, it emits uh, beta uh, particles, and these beta particles are tumorcidal, as well as a gamma particle, which allows it to be imaged. So we can actually visually see where this is going after we inject it. Um, by, the, uh, uh, by the gamma particles that are emitted. And the beta particles, um, they uh, are the ones that actually kill the cancer cells, but they only travel about two millimeters. And because of that, we're able to really restrict the radiation to the spinal fluid itself. And it doesn't really penetrate beyond the, um, the uh, outer layers of the brain. And uh, so the white matter, which are really sensitive to, to the radiation and really responsible for most of the, uh, the injury from radiation, those are really spared. This potentially can allow for much greater absorbed doses to the spinal fluid without uh, injuring the surrounding tissues. So uh, in our preclinical studies, as you can see here, uh, we, we see routinely uh, excellent results. On the uh, left, I showed you how the rhenium nanoliposomes or the rhenium of vesbameda um, uh, really stays within the tissue. And in the bottom left corner, you'll see that that translates to tumor control. So whereas the unencapsulated, the tumors continue to rapidly grow, when you have it encapsulated, it results in uh, long-term disease control. When we looked in a glioblastoma model, which made sense to us to be one of the uh, diseases that really should be uh, utilized here, or that this should be utilized for, uh, because 90% uh, of the time uh, disease recurs at the site of the initial treatment and radiation plays such an important role there. When we uh, used uh, uh, Rhenum abysma bimida in uh, these animal models, what we saw was a significant improvement in survival. In many cases, animals did not have any evidence of residual tumor after treatment. And a clear separation in terms of uh, when we did less than 100 gray, it really mimicked uh, what we saw in terms of normal disease. But once we gave it greater than 100 gray, uh, the animals seemed to have uh, excellent survival. Um, and we really didn't reach a maximum absorbed dose uh, in these animals. We uh, got up to over a thousand gray that we were administering in some of these animals, and they did uh, very well. Uh, similarly, when we looked in our leptomeningeal model, you can see um, uh, we uh, administered it directly into the ventricles of Worcester rats, and uh, it would redistribute, as you can see in the top right corner there, it would redistribute along the spinal fluid, um, and, uh, uh, and the animals tolerated it very well. Um, and when we looked in a C6 uh, leptomeningeal model, which is a glioma leptomeningeal model, we saw a significant improvement in survival. And uh, again, just to reiterate in terms of the safety, uh, we gave up to 1.34 millicuries uh, per rat directly into the ventricles, which seems like a very large dose. Um, considering the doses we're actually using in humans, it's, it's very large for that rat model. Um, and uh, while there was initially some uh, minor uh, insignificant weight loss within the first week. All those animals seemed to just thrive uh, thereafter. They didn't have any significant toxicity. And so we were able to, uh, to get absorbed doses in the uh, spinal fluid of over 1,000 gray also here, very similar to what we saw with GBM, where there was no significant toxicity. When we treated those uh, same type of uh, rats that uh, had previously been implanted with C6 tumors, we saw an improvement in survival. We then went on to look at a breast cancer model, the MDA-MB-231s. Um, we injected those into uh, nude rats directly into the ventricles and established tumors in the spinal fluid there. And then we treated them shortly uh, after we saw the uh, tumors uh, take. What we saw is that we got excellent tumor control that lasted out for, for weeks, whereas the uh, animals without um, renin nanoliposomes just receiving blank liposomes 
they continued to have growth and eventually succumb to their metastases. So that led to our phase one clinical trial that is currently ongoing. Um, this is a multicenter sequential cohort uh, dose escalation phase one clinical trial. Um, the primary endpoint is to determine the maximum tolerable dose, and uh, we may not reach a toler maximum tolerable dose, so it might be just the maximum feasible dose. Um, uh, each cohort um, receives uh, a single fixed volume um, of RNL uh, via intraventricular uh, catheter, so an Amaya reservoir, which is a catheter that goes directly into the ventricle, so they have that placed in advance of their uh, treatment. Um, we ha even had one patient who did so well that she received a second uh, compassionate use dose. So um, the inclusion criteria basically are proven uh, and documented leptomeningeal disease. And we're using basically the Eno ESMO clinical practice guidelines to uh, for the inclusion criteria. So anything except for um, a type 2D, which means that there's either no radiographic and or no cytologic evidence of disease with the leptomeninges. So anybody who has either radiographic or cytologic evidence of disease. Exclusion criteria, we really don't want patients who, um, who have obstructive hydrocephalus because we want this, the um, RNL or the rhenium of bimita to uh, circulate within the spinal fluid. Um, and then uh, they have to be able to, um, to uh, tolerate the dose. So standard organ dose criteria and, um, and uh, other uh, standard criteria. So uh, the way it works is patients have an OMIA placed. If they don't already have one, many of the, these patients already do um, for monitoring of the disease or treatment of the disease. Um, and if they don't, we go ahead and place one in. Then they undergo a flow study to make sure that their CSF is moving so that we inject the, the rhenium uh, into the ventricle that it really distributes along the spinal fluid. Um, and then they receive a drug infusion. And it really is very simple. It's very character, uh, very uh, uh, analogous to how we treat with chemotherapy uh, intraventricularly for these patients. We just take a syringe filled with uh, renin nanoliposomes, or renin bimida. We attach it to um, a needle and inject it directly into the MIR reservoir and then flush it with some saline and then allow it to redistribute along the CSF. Uh, we do standard um, assessments afterwards including um, checking blood, urine, and CSF, but we also do imaging by spec CT so that we can see what's going on, where this is going, and how long it's staying there. And, that, uh, and at various uh, time points, we do uh, MRI uh, as well as CSF collection to uh, follow the patient's disease. So, uh, so far we've had 10 subjects that have been treated with renal uh, nanoliposomes, 13 that have been screened over a period of around uh, 13 months, uh, 10 patients received a uh, dose, um, uh, nine of them received a single dose, one patient actually received a second dose due to the fact that she was doing so well, and this was uh, uh, based on her request that we were able to achieve a compassionate use dose. Um, five patients are currently alive. You can see the the demographics and the characteristics of these patients. Uh, the majority were uh, breast, and then we had um, a variety of the other um, uh, primary tumor types. And you can see the uh, absorbed doses here. Um, patients had uh, routinely uh, uh, increasing uh, absorbed doses in cohort one, we started off with the, to the ventricles and the cranial uh, subarachnoid space of around 24, 25 gray. And then in cohort two, as you expect, it went up to about 41 gray. And with cohort three, we were as high as almost 64 gray. Um, we could uh, also look at the individual structures. For example, the ventricles, you would expect to have a little bit of a lower dose because it's going to uh, leave the ventricles because of CSF flow. And there's not usually not as much tumor burden there as there is in the um, uh, in the subarachnoid space. Um, and so uh, lower doses there and then along the um, uh, spinal fluid. Importantly, the uh, absorbed dose to the organs was really very low and really not clinically significant. The spleen received about two or three um, gray. We didn't really see a, a dramatic increase with the increasing absorbed doses. Uh, liver absorbed dose uh, from less than one gray to about one gray, and blood absorbed dose was really 
um, uh, almost uh, unmeasurable. So uh, routinely saw excellent absorbed doses within the um, uh, cranial subarachnoid space um, and um, without significant organ absorbed doses. And in terms of tolerability, it was uh, very well tolerated. Um, uh, in the uh, 10 patients that we treated, there were no uh, dose limiting toxicities observed. We still haven't reached a maximum to uh, tolerable dose. Uh, most of the AEs that we um, observed were uh, mild uh, with the 58% uh, grade one and, tw and uh, grade two being about 24%. Um, the uh, uh, only uh, grade five AE was due to systemic disease progression, not really related to a uh, study drug. Uh, one SAE was uh, deemed possibly related, um, but uh, was attributed to the patient's pre-existing uh, condition. Five out of 10 patients remain alive without evidence of, um, uh, of any particular toxicity. And in terms of uh, our imaging, we were able to uh, uh, follow the patients to observe how the rhenium nanoliposomes or the rhenium abysma bimida was able to recirculate. And you can see in the uh, top right figure, we have uh, three images. The first is from a patient at about 15 minutes. And you can see at 15 minutes, the, um, the bulk of the activity remains in the ventricular system with some of it spreading out into the uh, spinal uh, CSF. But by 24 hours, uh, you have it completely absorbing along the subarachnoid space. It's, uh, uh, there is uh, relatively little in the ventricular system. Um, and it, so it is uh, on the subarachnoid uh, space and then along the uh, spine, particularly the spinal nerve roots, where we see a lot of, um, of uh, disease in many of these patients. And it stays there. And as you can see there on uh, the final right figure there, that at seven days, uh, it's uh, right where it was uh, after it uh, uh, was absorbed around 24 to 48 hours. We see it uh, just in the subarachnoid space and on the spinal roots. So excellent retention along the um, leptomeninges. And you can see in the bottom figure, a uh, spec CT image, which uh, shows the, again, the uh, 45 minutes post end of infusion, that it's mainly in the ventricular system, but then by 24 hours after the end of infusion, it's redistributed to the subarachnoid leptomeningeal spaces. And this uh, correlated with uh, a response based on cell counts. Uh, tumor cell counts decreased an average of 53% at day 28 compared to uh, pre-dose level. Um, again, uh, the primary uh, endpoint of the study is safety and, and determining the maximum tolerable dose. But even in these early cohorts, we're already seeing uh, some responses um, using the um, CN side assay that uh, Dr. Kumkutakar uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so the uh, uh, cells were uh, basically seen uh, to decrease at day 28. In terms of survival, uh, we've only treated 10 patients, but the data is looking promising. Uh, right now, we have a median over survival of about 10 months. Uh, as Dr. Kavar mentioned, the, um, uh, the uh, median survival for these patients is typically in the order of uh, about two to three months. Uh, so uh, this is promising, but still very early. So we're uh, continuing to enroll. Uh, we've completed cohort three. We are now approved to move forward with cohort four. We will now begin our Fibonacci scheme. We were, uh, previously were dose doubling. So the next cohort is an increase of about 67% uh, with the uh, 44 millicuries being administered uh, compared to 28 millicuries in the previous cohort. Um, and just to uh, reiterate again, um, uh, our 10 out of 13 patients who received uh, the intravicular dose was starting at 6.6 .6 millicuries and working up to 26.4 millicuries. Um, in all treated patients, we saw that the uh, that the uh, rhenium uh, bisbamida uh, circulated through the CSS space by one hour following administration and persisted for up to seven days. 
uh, we saw an increase in administered dose, which correlated to a linear increase in uh, the uh, absorbed dose. So uh, the uh, doses that we saw that were absorbed uh, were proportional to what we administered. Um, and then that we didn't see any significant DLTs. Most of the A's were grade one or grade two. CSF uh, tumor cell enumeration so decreased up to 91% uh, with an average of about 53%. Um, and the CSF uh, uh, tumor cell enumeration uh, uh, continues to look promising. Uh, we had five to 10 patients that were treated that remain alive with an overall survival of about 10 months right now. And then we continue to be in a dose escalation with uh, cohort four uh, now enrolling. Great, thank you. Um, so with, uh, with that, I'd like to begin our Q&A and roundtable uh, segment. Uh, first, I'd like to correct myself. Dr. Brenner is a professor of medicine, not associate professor. Uh, sorry about that. Um, also, I'll uh, note up front that Dr. Brenner will need to leave our session a little early to uh, to see a patient. So, thank you for the uh, the time. So, maybe we can uh, can jump right to a question for uh, for Dr. Brenner. You've uh, emphasized the tolerability that patients have experienced on therapy so far. Can you maybe provide any additional color on patient experiences? Uh, I know these patients have largely run out of options, but what would you expect the tolerability and efficacy to look like for alternative interventions at this stage of these patients' diseases? Yeah, well, that's um, uh, a very good question. So first of all, it's important to note that uh, one of our standard uh, modes of therapy that we use for these patients is intrathecal chemotherapy. And when you give intrathecal chemotherapy, you start off by giving chemotherapy twice per week and you do it until their cell counts decrease uh, to the point that uh, they're no longer detectable and then you do weekly for another month, et cetera. So it can be quite arduous on the patient. Uh, it, it's a, a very time consuming and a lot of effort for them, uh, especially in a disease which, uh, which has no, uh, which we're not planning to cure them, we're trying to palliate them and hopefully provide some uh, life extension. Um, and so, other treatments can be quite arduous for them. In this case, patients are really uh, just amazed that they get one injection and then they don't have to do anything for, you know, for a significant period of time. And in many of these cases, patients have had um, uh, done very well. As I mentioned, five out of 10 remain alive. I've had one patient who was treated uh, well over a year ago, I believe March of last year, and, um, and then received a second dose uh, earlier this year. And so two treatments over a period of beyond a year for them is, you know, really uh, impressive in terms of allowing them to go on with a reasonable quality of life without being in the clinic all the time. On top of that, when you think of involved field radiation, uh, patients have to basically show up to the clinic for radiation treatments every day for um, two weeks uh, at a time. So, um, and it's not without symptoms. So I think that the, from at least where we are right now, this seems to be uh, very convenient for patients um, and uh, can really be done in any uh, clinical center because, you know, as long as they have an Amaya reservoir, it's just a simple injection as opposed to many of the advanced techniques like uh, proton craniospinal radiation, things like that. So very simple for patients, very low burden for patients, and, um, and so far has been very well tolerated. Got it. And maybe a, uh, a quick follow-up on that, um, Dr. Brenner, just sort of wondering on the, the ease of use of working with the, the Rhenium-186. Uh, you sort of mentioned some of the, I guess, logistical challenges of, of some of the alternatives there, but uh, are there sort of added complexities on, uh, with this particular product? And, and, and do you think that it, it stacks up pretty well against some of the, the other things that you mentioned? Yeah, so uh, it, we're still evaluating efficacy. And so while phase one res, uh, results uh, look very promising, uh, the whole point of the study is to get to a dose that we know uh, is the maximum tolerable dose so we can use that going forward and then better evaluate efficacy. So we'll take any endpoints we can, or in term, I'm sorry, any early evidence of efficacy we can. We're certainly looking at those, but we still have a little ways to go in terms of uh, in terms of declaring this efficacious or not. Um, but in terms of uh, the logistics of it, you know, I think for a lot of people working with radiation can uh, seem a little bit intimidating, um, but uh, this has been really 
uh, straightforward. You, you know, the pay, this is uh, analogous to a lot of other um, uh, radiotherapeutics that are used in the clinic in terms of safety. Um, so, you know, we don't, ha there's not like extensive precautions that are needed. We, we administer it in a nuclear medicine suite. Um, and that's mainly for convenience so that the patients um, can go straight to imaging without having to go from one place to another. Um, but uh, really, it's, it's really straightforward. I mean, it's a five minute injection um, and it's not like we have to, you know, um, use a lot of uh, special precautions for it. Got it. And so one one more question before I let you go and, uh, and see your patient. Don't want to keep them waiting too long. Um, so, Dr. Brenner, what, what additional evidence would you find most compelling in terms of uh, confirming clinical benefit and potentially convincing colleagues to use this asset uh, as, uh, as, as clinical data that begins to accrue? Well, you know, I think, uh, uh, and Dr. Kumkakar did a good job of uh, kind of elaborating the challenges here. It's really hard to radiographically or even using cell counts or things like that to quantify response in this disease. And certainly use of the CN side assay is, um, you know, very robust and certainly may help us. Uh, but ultimately what people want to see is survival, um, that you treated, you know, patients and, um, and that uh, they lived a long time after treatment with a good quality of life. And so uh, that's going to be the real uh, test for us is that do we make patients live longer or not? Um, in a disease that is um, terribly burdensome uh, with a lot of morbidity and uh, with very short survival. So uh, we'll see what the data shows, but um, uh, certainly uh, uh, it looks promising at this point in time. Uh, but, you know, as we get further along, I think we, we, we hopefully will have more convincing data in terms of survival benefit. Great. Thank you. So maybe we can uh, turn to uh, to Dr. Coomtaker now, and uh, maybe you can give us some of your your thoughts on uh, the the tolerability side of things, and and what you've seen with uh, with patients, uh, and and just some of your your perspectives. Yeah, and many of them echo echo that of Dr. Brunner's and and what he mentioned in terms of of patient tolerability and. Um, there's multiple elements to it. So there is the symptomatic tolerability, of course. Um, and that I think, you know, we really haven't seen a lot of issues with that. So that's been, that's been very helpful because what we want to do, I will say to our patients, you know, we want to hit the, the cancer hard and not hit you hard. And I think this drug and this therapeutic, I should say, really epitomizes that. And the other piece that I'll highlight that Dr. Brenner touched on is that this is a one-time dosing. And there's a lot that has been spoken about, particularly in the past year or two within oncology, about the toxicity of time, right? This is a, this is a disease where, you know, unfortunately right now is known to have no cure and, and be very end stage. And so not only do we want to maintain a patient's quality of life, but we want to be very respectful of their time that they have with their loved ones. And so this, this therapeutic is something that to Dr. Brenner's point, keeps them out of the clinic. Um, and our traditional intrathecal therapies are typically twice weekly. And even when patients graduate from that, it's, it can go from weekly or to monthly. So it's, it's this longitudinal time commitment that takes them from what they're doing outside of the treatment space, outside of the clinic. So I really appreciate the symptomatic tolerability, the minimal impact to quality of life, but really want to highlight that it minimizes that toxicity of time. Got it. Uh, Dr. Brenner had had mentioned that this uh, the the procedure really seems like it, it could be pretty widespread in terms of uh, types of centers uh, administering it. So maybe you could uh, expand a little bit uh, on that. Um, either either one of you uh, is this something that you you think would really be relegated to like major university hospitals, or do you think it could move to really any hospital that has a, a nuclear medicine department or, or even to centers that are uh, maybe a little bit more in the, the outpatient side of things? Um, and then sort of building on that, 
uh, the, de depending on how the clinical data evolves, wondering just your thoughts on how widespread you could see the usage of rhenium obispamata and, and how you think that this could actually be impacted by advancements in uh, the diagnostic uh, technology and, and utilization. Yeah, I mean, some of it you kind of answered within the question. Uh, definitely, this is something that can be used widespread. I don't see this as just an academic center by any means. This would be a, a center that is used to injecting via an Omaya reservoir, which quite frankly is much easier than a lumbar puncture, which pretty much every center does. So I think very user friendly in terms of the actual injection given by the local clinician. I think it needs to have, of course, as you mentioned, nuclear medicine. I think that's key. But that can be as an outpatient basis, absolutely. So outpatient, nuclear medicine, widespread, academic, community, urban, rural, all of that I think is on the table with a, with a nuclear medicine capability. And I'll, I'll add just a little bit to that um, before I run. Uh, you know, I think that if we, we ask ourselves this question maybe 10 or 15 years ago, the answer might be a little bit different. And I think there is a little bit of reluctance in terms of radiation therapy and people's perceptions in the community about radiation. But that's really changing over the years with new drugs like Sofago and other radiotherapeutics, which are routinely finding their way into clinical practice. And, uh, and I agree with everything that Dr. Kimtikar said uh, just a moment ago. It is relatively simple, and I think it can really be in a community center. And I think the stigma of uh, radiation hopefully is going away. We've been using radioactive iodine to treat thyroid cancer for decades now. And look what a dramatic difference we've made in thyroid cancer. I mean, that is one of the most important forms of therapy for, for that particular disease that is available. And, um, and it's routinely available. Um, so we need to really uh, to be able to try and get something uh, similar for other diseases like this, like leptomeningeal disease. Um, and I think that, that there's a, a, a reasonable probability that this could be something that that even um, uh, standard community hospitals are able to administer like they do radioactive iodine. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, Dr. Brenner. I'll have one more, one more question for uh, Dr. Uh, Coomtaker and then uh, a, a couple for, uh, for Dr. Hedrick. So um, Dr. Coomtaker, I I'm wondering if you can comment on some potential advantages or, or disadvantages of the approach being taken with uh, rhenium-186 of bispameda in the LM compared to molecularly targeted radiopharmaceutical approaches uh, and or external beam uh, radiotherapy? Yeah, I think there are a couple that come to top of mind. So the first is CSF flow abnormalities is really important here. So as <coughs> Dr. the workflow for a patient on the RESPECT LM study, um, that second step was a CSF flow study. And the reason we're doing this is that if we're injecting into the CSF, we need to make sure that there are no flow issues in CSF. And that can be disturbed by nodular leptomeningeal disease that literally is kind of pressing into that CSF tubing. So if we have that, then you can get accumulations in, in various parts of the CNS access. So from a safety perspective, we don't know what what that would entail. So I would say bulky, the first uh, kind of hurdle that we might want to look at overcoming is, is bulky leptomeningeal disease. I do think it might be overcomable, but we just need to, to do those studies. And we're starting in a very safe and effective manner with looking for patients without CSF flow abnormalities. The, the, the second and, and important one is, is also um, prior radiation, right? So we don't we don't know the impact quite yet of what this looks like after a patient has had proton beam craniospinal irradiation or photon craniospinal radiation or whole brain radiation or all of these different categories of radiation. And I would say vice versa as well. So what does it look like if a patient receives this and then goes on to receive something else? And in a, a non-anecdotal fashion, do we have that data? So I think these are kind of the two of the things that in the future we'll certainly be looking at. 
Great, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so my, my first of uh, two questions here for Dr. Hedrick. So can you comment on the, uh, the supply chain for Rhenium-186 and, and what additional works need to be done to ensure a sufficient clinical and then commercial supply, uh, particularly in the context of uh, Dr. Brenner and, and Dr. Uh, Coomtaker really thinking that this could uh, see widespread use if it, it proves efficacious? Uh, Justin, thanks for the question. So, um, I mean, to, to begin with, uh, we have ample supply for our kind of current and sort of near-term needs, so that includes phase two and phase three. Um, when you're thinking about GBM alone, and uh, Dr. Kumtakar mentioned it's about 15, 20, 12 to 15,000 patients in the U.S. per year, that's a, that's a very different animal than a hundred thousand patients a year, potentially, and potentially even multiple doses after that. So, about a year ago, um, you know, planning for success as it relates to leptomeningeal uh, disease, we began doing a series of activities uh, to expand the uh, supply chain opportunity, and that includes bringing on a second uh, GMP supplier, which is ongoing. Uh, building in resiliency to all the different components. It's a complex drug in a way. So we want to have a GMP supply for all the individual uh, drug intermediates, uh, which is which is in play. And so I think we're to give you some example of what we're what we've been working on. And then we've added some uh, expertise on our drug development team to be able to, to scale appropriately. So we're we have a plan uh, such that, you know, if we get accelerated approval, for example, for LM, that we can uh, be uh, be ready uh, at that point with uh, to to supply any sort of conceivable um, uh, supply uh, issues that come up uh, in terms of demand for the product. Got it. Thank you. So, last question uh, before we uh, we call it a day for this event: uh, What do you think investors are missing about Rhenium Abyspamata's potential, and and what do you think it would take to increase its visibility at this point? So kind of kind of macro issues aside right now, right? And, and uh, we'll talk about uh, the, the, these two opportunities. We effectively have two co-lead opportunities. I think people have thought about us maybe as a, as a GBM focused company. Uh, well, that's not the case anymore, right? I consider LM a, a co-lead and perhaps maybe even approvable uh, before GBM because of the unmet medical need, um, the uh, the significance of the disease, as, as you've heard today, and the ease of use, uh, but in but but I'll kind of break it down into two. So in terms of GBM, GBM is a smaller market. There are multiple trials ongoing, and the history of GBM drug development has been things that work in in animal models or in phase one don't often translate into phase three and to approval. And I think we have some advantages there. Um, We've solved the blood-brain barrier issue with this drug. The mechanism of action is clear-cut. Uh, we could get very high doses of radiation, and we know radiation works. It's been proven safe, and even in the phase one, we have a promising efficacy signal. So I think, as Dr. LaFrance, our chief medical officer, says, in radiotherapeutics, if it works in phase one, it's much more likely to work in phase three than it is outside the radiotherapeutic space. So I think we're optimistic. Uh, that, that that's the case. And I think that's maybe a, a gap in terms of, of where we are and what the market thinks. And then in terms of LM, I think it's just kind of new on our horizon. This is the first time we've presented meaningful data in LM. Um, I think you've heard today the uh, enthusiasm for the drug just based on preliminary data. Uh, we also have a potential, you know, probably uh, companion diagnostic in terms of the Biosep C inside assay that we can now um, diagnose it more, more reliably, uh, follow it over time, and follow the um, you know the progress of treatment, which you know has been very difficult up to now. So I think you got to marry a novel therapeutic with a novel test um, for a very big unmet medical need, and oh by the way, you have a number of centers that are really trying to get into the trial. I think it speaks to the the opportunity there, and I think when the market understands that opportunity, I think that'll be reflected in, in how they view the company. Great. Well, hopefully uh, events like this will uh, will help move that along. Um, with that, uh, I would like to uh, to thank everyone for uh, for tuning in and have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate it.